Well, good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So glad that something prompted you from your home and into this place and pray you have a hope-filled experience of worship this day. We want to welcome each of you here. We want to welcome those who are worshiping by radio or Facebook Live and hope that they can feel our spirit with them across the airwaves. We bow for our invocation. We greet you welcoming God in this hour of worship. Some of us couldn't wait to get here and some of us just barely made it. Some of us know exactly why we've come. Others are not sure. Still something calls each of us to you. And so today we come to seek and worship. In Christ's name, amen.
And we proclaim with conviction and aspiration these words we know so well. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. our time of prayer and uh, you'll find on the back of your bulletin folks that we've been in prayer about and will continue to be in prayer about we trust that ours is a God who knows all and is hard at work on things we know nothing of and for, forgives our forgetfulness in this time of prayer I want to um, lift up in prayer though this morning all of our men and women in the military and who may be in harm's way right now, especially in the U.S. response to the conflict in Iran. So we lift up all of our men and women in the military. And while I didn't ask his permission to share this, a prayer of thanksgiving that, um, that Bobby got a great report from your surgeon in Memphis, and we are thrilled that you've got an all clear and 2020 vision. <laughs> Knowing what God, that God has remembered what we've uh, forgotten, we pause now for a moment of simple silence and to go to God in prayer. Would you bow with me? In your mercy, almighty God, hear these quiet prayers of your people. We give you thanks for the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you forgive us and give us power to begin anew, afresh. Come to us this day and touch those secret places in our lives that we most need to change and tear down the barriers that keep us from loving others. We ask, O oh God, that you would root out all violence in our lives and in our world, that you would free us from dependency on anything other than you, that we might put our full trust in you. In moments when we doubt our future, O oh Lord, return us to the witness of your word just as you had a plan for the Israelites to free them from captivity and exile, you have a plan for us, for a future filled with hope. Help us to see the world around us, all of it, so much bigger than what our immediate sight reveals. Help us to remember that it's not just our family and our community that you've entrusted to our care, but the family of humanity the totality of the very world we live in. Teach us how to be in prayer for those things we know about and even for those challenges and cares that we know nothing of. Today, as we celebrate the sacrament of communion, remind us of the power of redemption in the sacrifice of Christ and the power of redemption in this holy meal. And now, mighty, mighty healer, we lift these prayers of joy and of concern to you, and we ask these things in the name of the one who came teaching us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Typically, when you see me up here, it's due, uh, because Susan is absent. But for those of you with sharp eyes, you will see that Susan is indeed with us today, and Beth is absent. Susan is taking her place at the piano, and uh, Beth is absent today. She's taking a much needed vacation, and we hope she enjoys herself and has safe passage. Uh, let's continue our song, uh, our singing, uh, with My Faith Looks Up to Thee. We'll sing uh, verses 1, 3, and 4. Please stand. and beyond comes from God, our creator and provider. And so we pause now to return these small gifts, asking that God might bless them and bless us to give generously. You may be seated.
thanks to you for all your many gifts to us. Bless these, we pray, that they might multiply to do the work of your kingdom here and everywhere. And teach us, O God, what it means to believe in your radical generosity. We lift these now in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. my favorite, favorite pieces of music. Our lay reader this morning is Barbara Lott, and we give thanks for her bringing the word from Isaiah. Good morning, everybody. Our text this morning is from the 40th chapter of Isaiah. Hear now the word of the Lord. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Barbara. I want to make a quick announcement um, while I'm thinking about it. I, I think sometimes we forget about our communion uh, when it rolls around, and, and we may forget that there is a communion offering each Sunday. That is, any amount of money, a check or cash or change that's left here at the prayer rail goes to the pastor's benevolence fund to help um, really, really needy people in our community. So just wanted to um, remind you of that, and um, I'm going to prime the pump. Anyway, let's get us started a little bit. Well, will you pray with me now? <clears throat> May the words of my mouth, O oh God, and the meditations of my heart and each heart gathered here be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Have you not known? Have you not heard? Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, how we love this passage of scripture, don't we? We may not remember anything else in the book of Isaiah, but we know this one and we love it. It gives us hope. It gives us courage. It's one of the reasons it's read at funerals so often. It's a reminder that God's strength is greater than our grief. But it isn't just for funerals, and it's about a whole lot more than just that. I want you to hear the lesson again, but this time from Peterson's translation, uh, the message kind of makes it plain. He says it like this. Don't you know anything? Haven't you been listening God doesn't come and go. God lasts. He's creator of all you can see or imagine. He doesn't get tired out, doesn't pause to catch his breath, and he knows everything inside and out. He energizes those who get tired, gives fresh strength to dropouts. For even young people tire and drop out, Young folk in their prime stumble and fall. But those who wait upon God get fresh strength. They spread their wings and soar like eagles, run and don't get tired, walk and don't lag behind. Aren't those powerful words? This is one of the most beautiful passages from Isaiah and certainly one that we are so familiar with. But... I'm preaching this month from the Revised Common Lectionary, which gives you a suggested passage to preach from each week, gives you uh, five of them, actually, to choose from. And the lectionary reading for today actually begins at verse 21. It's a lot longer than what we, what we heard, and we'll get to that in a minute. But we know that uh, this passage from Isaiah 40 comes from what we call second Isaiah. Now, I know, I know there's not a second Isaiah in the Bible. But chapters 40 through 55 are called second Isaiah because they were written after the rest of it, much later. Uh, the writer um, wrote it probably in around 540 before the common error, before Christ. And it was written in relation to the end of the Babylonian exile. Most of Isaiah is about the exile in itself. Second Isaiah has to do with the end of that exile. You remember the Persians, the Babylonians came in and ran out the Israelites from Judah and Jerusalem. But right now, at this stage in history, Cyrus and the Persians have conquered Judah. And Cyrus decided to make it possible for the exiled Hebrews to return. Second Isaiah urges the Judeans living in exile to see this circumstance as a simple continuation of Israel's story from the past. Judeans are called to see the opportunity to return to Judah as a second exodus a chance to renew their faithfulness to the ancient, their ancient God, Yahweh. And they needed to renew their faithfulness to Yahweh. It was time. It was overdue. Second Isaiah chapters 40 through 55 are characterized by comfort and invitation. There's a little bit of rebuke in there from time to time, but comfort and invitation. I invite you to read uh, each chapter 40 through 55. Those who have been in exile are invited to imagine themselves once again as descendants of Jacob, who is also known as Israel, to imagine themselves as servants of God and as children of Jerusalem. Well, that's all well and good, <clears throat> but the challenge is that they have been in exile away from their home for over 50 years. 
That's a long time. By now their mothers have died, their fathers have died never to see their homeland again. And by now they've raised at least one or two generations who know nothing about Israel, Judah. Babylon is their home. Fifty years in exile. Think about your home that you love so much, where you're so comfortable. Think about your life in Colombia and what it might be like if suddenly you were forced away away from your land, away from your friends, away from the home that has become sacred space for you. Fifty plus years they've been waiting for God. Why should they believe that there is suddenly a plan for their release? It's no wonder they were doubtful. In fact, in the verses just before what we read for today, the prophet proclaims, Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? The people of Babylonian exile felt that their way was hidden from the Lord, like God no longer saw them, that God can't locate them, that God has long since forgotten about them. And even if Cyrus has made it possible for them to return to Judah, they're scared. Babylon is their home now. They've established careers, married, had children, and some have even deserted following Yahweh altogether and maybe taken on some of those Babylonian gods. And suddenly, there's a prophet who tells them it's safe to go back. Not only tells them it's safe to go back, but urges them to do so. After 50 plus years in exile, most of those returning would have hardly known the place. It had changed. Exile was hard, but returning was difficult too. Some of you know the challenge of going back home again and how that can be hard. So the prophet works to remind them of who God really is, to bring back to their memory all that God has done and will do. He begins in verse 21 with the rhetorical questions. Have you not known? Have you not heard? They are rhetorical. Has it not been told to you from the beginning? They're rhetorical because of course they've known and of course they've heard and of course they've been told from the beginning. They've, they've just kind of forgotten. The prophet goes on to remind them that it is Yahweh who sits above the circle of the earth, who stretches out the heavens like curtains and spreads them like a tent to live in. In other words, it was Yahweh who gave you a place, period. Who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. In other words, Yahweh is stronger and more powerful than all the rulers of the earth. Finally, the the writer of 2nd Isaiah in chapter 40 reminds them in verse 26 to lift up their eyes to the heavens. Who created these? He asks. And the answer? Yahweh. Remember, he's telling them, remember. But the people proclaim our way has been hidden from the Lord and all our rights have been disregarded by God for over 50 years. Those are the verses before what we read for today. Now we're at verse 28. And this is what they hear. You may grow faint. You may grow weary. But the Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the earth. 
He does not grow faint, does not grow weary. Verse 28 is, is proclaiming that there's more to come. Verse 28 is telling them, just hold on. God has not forgotten you. There is a plan for your future. There's something bigger going on here. God is not finished with Israel yet. When they faint, God will give them power. And, and when they feel powerless, God will strengthen them. It's no wonder this is read at funerals, right? When they faint, they will receive power. When they feel powerless, God will strengthen them. And those are the things they were feeling in response to being urged to go back home. They felt faint. They felt powerless. Like they just could not do it. The people of God were in exile. And sometimes it can feel like we're in exile too, can't it? Oh, to, to be exiled is to be expelled from your, your country or your nation. We read about that in the news. But sometimes exile for the rest of us has to do with isolation from what comforts and encourages. It means to sometimes feel God's absence more than we feel God's presence. That's what it feels like to be in exile. Perhaps not expelled, but deserted. To be unable to have a vision for the future to be afraid of what is ahead because we can't get a clear picture of it is exactly what the exiled Judeans felt. And we can identify with that, can't we? Because we don't know the future either. And on our best days, we just we lodge our hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ and we know that God has something more for us and there is a larger plan. That's on our best days. But what about those other days? We are, after all, human. To be unable to have a vision for the future, to be afraid of what is ahead because we don't have a clear picture is exactly what the exiled Judeans felt, and we can identify with that too. And so with the children of Judah, we wait. We wait for clarity. We wait for an absolute clear picture of what tomorrow holds. And it may seem fruitless, but hear the good news. Waiting is not just for the sake of waiting. It is not waiting as those who have no hope. The writer of 2 Isaiah tells us that those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength and shall mount up with wings like eagles and shall run and not be weary. It's not waiting for waiting's sake. It's waiting for the Lord, and that's different. It is the very God we wait for who gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. For people of faith, waiting is an action word. It's not just sitting around. There is doing in the waiting because we believe. And we don't wait for waiting's sake. We wait because we know that in the future, God is already there. So when we wait for the future, we wait for the Lord. Yep, faith. Waiting is an action word. It is living life in spite of being afraid of the future. 
And those exiled Judeans were afraid of the future. Their past hadn't been so good. Maybe the future would not be so good either. And the last time they saw Judah, it was ugly and brutal. Waiting is an action word, living life in spite of being afraid of the future. It is living life because even if we don't know what the future holds, God knows. God knows what the future holds. It is knowing that when we least expect it, God's going to show up and proclaim, you can go home again. Today's passage from Isaiah addresses a tired and weary people who likely had some trouble imagining a new future. And sometimes we're tired and weary too, aren't we? Sometimes we have trouble imagining a new future. But moving forward with joy into a newly created future that we can't yet imagine requires strength beyond what we possess on our own. But we move toward the future because we know that God already resides in the future and awaits us. We do not wait without hope. We wait on the Lord, who is the ground of our hopefulness. For the people in exile and for us too, the creative power of God opens a way where before we may not have seen a way. I'm going to say that again. For the people in exile and for us too, the creative power of God opens a way where before we may not have seen a way. Waiting, not for waiting's sake, but waiting on the Creator, the Lord God Almighty. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted, but those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. Let me, let me change the they to we. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. You see, the promise of God's continual creative work with its mysterious yet life-giving power continues to be a word of hope for God's tired and weary people. Then and right now. So let us wait for the Lord. In our future, the Lord is waiting for us. Will you pray with me? Oh God, ground us in the witness of your word and remind us to look to our ancestors to whom you gave hope, for whom you prepared a future. And know that just as you did so for them, you do so for us. So wherever we are on the journey and whatever we are feeling, any measure of uncertainty, any measure of weariness and tiredness, help us to wait as those who have hope. And help us to know when we arrive, you will be waiting for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen invite you to take your hymnal this morning and turn to page 12. This is, um, we don't often turn to our hymnal for uh, consecrating the elements. I usually just tell the story, but this morning we're going to let these words remind us of all that is most powerful and, and important in this great story of redemption from Christ's sacrifice. Beginning on page 12. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. 
Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray and confess in silence. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And beginning with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Would invite those who are helping to serve communion to come at this time.
I've asked uh, Hal and Pat to serve communion to you today because I'm a little bit unsteady on my feet. But as a reminder, ours is an open communion table. You do not need to be United Methodist or a member of this church to come and receive. The table is set. The meal is prepared. I pray that you will come this day. Invite the choir to come at this time. Go forth to freely give and to be a witness to the redemption of this holy meal to the world and beyond. Amen. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves his love for us. Go forth from this place, having received the peace of this holy meal, and share that peace with the world. Go in peace. Amen.
Christ be with you. The promise of reconciliation that comes in this meal be with you. Go now to proclaim the good news to the world. Amen. May the God who raised Christ from the dead raise your hearts and your spirits from the inside out, having eaten of this new meal. Go in peace. Amen. May the love of God that abides in this holy meal fill you and protect you, encourage you and guard you as you go forth in peace. Amen. Let us pray. 
All honor and glory is yours, almighty God. We come in prayerful thanksgiving for the sweetness of this meal and all that it means, as your people make us truly, truly grateful for all that has been done on our behalf and for the opportunity to gather as community and break this bread in your name. Amen. You're invited this morning, as always, to come to the altar and pray during our final hymn, if you'd like, or if you'd like to dedicate your life to Christ for the first time or rededicate your life, you're invited to come forward and be welcomed. Maybe you'd like to join this church and become a member here in a more formal way. Just know that I'll greet you here, and you will always be welcome. Our final hymn this morning is on eagle's wings. We'll sing it twice through. Please stand. strength to the powerless. With this promise in heart and hand, let us go forth to proclaim this good news and to be a witness to the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> 